Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We have good, sort of, good that it was exposed. As we just explained on Memorial Day, sometimes the good martini is, uh, you got to squint, you got to tilt it, get it in the right light kind of a thing. But it deals with Anthony Fauci's testimony on Capitol Hill yesterday. Uh, Then we'll talk about some uh, definite bad news out of Mexico that did not get nearly the attention that it should have. Uh, And then finally, uh, some craziness from the president of the United States as it relates to the Middle East. So, uh, Jim, yesterday we talked about uh, Dr. Fauci admitting to congressional investigators months ago in preparation for congressional testimony that there wasn't really a ton of science uh, behind uh, rules like the six feet social distancing or even masking kids, which is completely unconscionable. Yesterday, Fauci tried to weasel his way out of that saying, I was from the CDC. It's not like I was investigating it. Uh, But yesterday... Uh, under questioning from, uh, I think it was Congressman McCormick from Georgia. They had a recording of Fauci talking to someone. And uh, it's always when you don't think anybody else is paying attention that perhaps sometimes you get the most revealing. And here's what uh, Fauci had to say after his host uh, definitely led him down the path of, hey, well, if we really want to get this done, uh, this this vaccination regime, we've got to force it. We've got to have mandates, even though you guys don't like to use that term. And here's what Fauci said in vigorous agreement with that. Once people feel empowered and protected legally, you are going to have schools, universities, and colleges are going to say, you want to come to this college, buddy? You're going to get vaccinated. Lady, you're going to get vaccinated. Yeah. Big corporations like Amazon and Facebook and, and, and all of those others are going to say, you want to work for us? You get vaccinated. And it's been proven that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, they lose their ideological bull and they get vaccinated. When you make people's lives difficult, they'll do what you want them to do in defiance of their own ideology. Jim, that is the exact opposite for the most part of what government should be doing here. Uh, we had many different conversations, of course, about the vaccine mandates and once again, uh, Fauci, of course, in his testimony saying, oh, you're taking that out of context. I'm not really sure how you take that out of context, where if you want to go to school, if you want that job, you got to do what we tell you. Uh, that is uh, overbearing government, to put it mildly. And uh, once again, confronted with the cold, hard facts, he pretends otherwise. Yeah, there's I guess you could have two schools of thought about Fauci and his leadership during the pandemic. That The first is that maybe at one point he was the image that was sold to us, this grandfatherly, just the facts, reliable, America's old doctor who's, you know, seen all this stuff before and knows just what to do and is going to give it to you straight and all that stuff. Maybe he was always bad or maybe he was a better version of himself. But at various points during the pandemic, I don't think it's wild eyed, crazy talk to say that Fauci stopped being that image that we were sold. Maybe it was the first baseball game that was played when he was the one person who got to attend the game uh, sitting alone in the stands. I believe it was Nationals and Yankees. And I think it got rained out or or rain delayed at some point. But um, I think it was either Vanity Fair or one, one of the glossy magazines did this big profile and had a picture of him sitting by his poolside. And I just I, I don't need fashion spreads of Fauci and, and, you know, all of that. Brad Pitt playing him on Saturday Night Live and talking about the love ladies, the love letters he was getting from older women. Um, it was, it was, it was like the process of turning someone from a not relatively well-known government official slash policy expert to the process of turning them into a celebrity, to the process of turning them into a symbol once you appear on a prayer candle, it's not good. You, you, it is, it is, your ego is going to sprout out beyond uh, all possible limitations. And I think this, it was almost inevitable that Fauci would return into the kind of person who would say under testimony, so it's easy to criticize, but they're really criticizing science because I represent science. That's dangerous. You know, Napoleon, the state is me, is I, you know, I am the science. You know, uh, Fauci emulating Judge Dredd, I am the law. Um, The thing is that he isn't. And we just found out today, you know, yesterday that he he knew the six foot rule just kind of appeared. And that, you know, 
This is a very dangerous attitude. This idea that I, as a government leader, my job is to change your beliefs. My job is to make you believe what I want you to believe. And my job is to force you, to strong arm you into doing this. Now, look, we could argue about the vaccines. Uh, you know, you and I got vaccinated. We're glad we did. Uh, well, actually, I, I, don't, I, should, I shouldn't speak. You, 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 got, you actually got it and you, were, you had natural immunity. No, reluctantly. And then I got COVID immediately after I got it. Yeah, there you go. See, T teaches you right, Greg. Um, no, this, you know, I, I prefer people did, but I have friends who didn't. And I didn't, you know, I try not to give them too much grief about it. But it, it was one of those things where, you know, it's one thing if I say, hey, my friend, I hope you get you get vaccinated. I think it'd be better for you. I don't want to see anything happen to you. It's another thing when I am in the government, I'm going to use the power of government or I'm going to strong arm corporations and schools and other institutions. And I'm going to make you get vaccinated when you don't want to. And, you know, Fauci could not grasp the danger of, of what he was doing and how he was stepping into the role of the villain that all of these people who were uh, skeptical of the vaccines or afraid of the vaccines or freaked out about the vaccines, he was turning into the villain that they were that they had painted him as. And, and he just seemed blind to that. And so uh, it is good this is coming up to coming to light. I don't think Fauci's reputation is what it used to be. I'm pretty sure those prayer candles, you can now get them a great discount. And uh, <laughs> it's just a... Just don't, you know, you know who belongs on, on prayer candles? Saints, not uh, any particular Democratic celebrity du jour, Stacey Abrams, et cetera. First of all, good rule of thumb. If the mainstream media has decided to play fangirl with any public official and make it basically forbidden to criticize said public official over anything, there's a reason for that. And your spidey sense really ought to be going off really, really loud. And then the, the mainstream media did that. And when Fauci got wobbly over the George Floyd protests, well, I'm not sure it's a good idea, even though I'm telling you you can't go to your grandma's funeral. I guess you can go to the protests with 100,000 of your favorite friends, and uh, you can't really do the social distance. Eh, it's going to be fine. It's a, it's a big cause, so it, then it's okay. So that's when he lost virtually all credibility with me. And then, you know, this whole idea, and I think you articulated it well, of uh, my job is to force you to do this thing. Even if you think it's it's for a good cause, uh, and of course there were lies that he spit out of. If you get the vaccine, there's no way you can get COVID if you can't transmit it. Uh, and so he then he was still berating the unvaccinated for infecting the vaccinated. It was just it was just a big mess, natural immunity, all that stuff. So this whole power trip that politicians were on, from governors like Andrew Cuomo to Gavin Newsom to federal officials like Anthony Fauci. This needs to be clear, major warning about this never happening again. And hopefully if we ceded a ton of power, we've clawed it back or can still claw it back. Good okay. thing Republicans <laughs> did nominate the guy who was in charge back then. Right, Greg? Anyway. That's a <laughs> that was like the only issue DeSantis really challenged Trump on was, yeah, yeah, I would have yeah. fired Fauci, which is good, but you need to talk about some other stuff too. <laughs> All right, Jim, on to our bad martini now and the subject of your morning jolt today. And that's what's going on in Mexico. Tangentially, I guess you could connect it to what President Biden is about to do on the executive action that he's going to do on the border, which he promised for years he couldn't do without the authorization of Congress. But now he's stinking in the polls and uh, needs to do something on the border. So he's going to. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people are going to fall for it. Uh, I think they'll be more frustrated that he didn't do it four years ago. Nonetheless, there is going to be a new president in Mexico. AMLO is going to be out, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and in his place, Claudia Scheinbaum. Yes, the Mexicans have elected a female Jewish president, although as you point out clearly here in the article, she is no friend of Israel, considers herself a secular Jew, and uh, is very sympathetic to the plight of Gaza, for example. Worst of all, she's another socialist, Jim. So uh, as, as I was saying to you, because one of your one of your points in the jolt today is that Americans really didn't pay attention to the fact that there was an election or what the implication of this could be for America. And I consider myself someone who pays pretty close attention to what's going on in other nations of significance to the United States. I didn't know there was an election until they started announcing the results a couple of days ago. So obviously we we all dropped the ball here somewhere. So what do we need to know about Scheinbaum and will anything significantly change? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, there's this headline in the Wall Street Journal today. Biden seeks to tighten border. And I'm sure, you know, everyone who picks it up is like, where's he been? You know, <laughs> it's June 2024. We've been talking about this since like his first months in office when President Biden assured us that this was a 
merely a seasonal pattern. It was nothing out of the ordinary. And of course, we've seen huge waves of migrants coming to the border, pretty much the entirety of its presidency. Uh, for much of that time, AMLO has not been cooperative. It's gotten a little bit better in the past few months. The rate has gone down slightly. Uh, still very high by historical patterns, but uh, uh, AMLO really has not been, for most of his uh, six-year presidency, an ally to the United States in terms of stemming the tide of migrants trying to work their way north. Um, AMLO also allegedly uh, has, has you know, in the pocket or has close ties or has been playing footsie with the Sinaloa cartel. So there are numerous people in the United States Drug Enforcement Agency who would say the Mexican government is not a serious partner uh, in their fight against the cartels. And the violence in Mexico has been absolutely terrible. As bad as the cost of fentanyl on America's cities and America's small towns has been, um, the cost of innocent Mexicans has been off the charts in terms of the violence of the cartels down there. Considering the amount of discussion of the border and the amount of the discussion of illegal immigration, you would think the U.S. media would pay a little, at least a little bit more attention to what's going on in the Mexican government. And I don't know about you, Greg, I feel like I hear almost nothing about it, that I have to go looking for news about this. Uh, maybe it's just a generalized cynicism that the Mexican government is corrupt and ineffective and and hopeless. And I can't begrudge someone, but that doesn't mean the media can just say, eh, we're just not going to pay attention to this stuff anymore. So, you know, and, and also maybe it's bad luck for Mexico that the presidential election uh, that they have every six years happens two days after the Trump conviction, which is a very big deal and people were discussing and paying a lot of attention to. Um, but, I, you know, it's now been several days and to the extent that the U.S. media has noticed Mexico's next president, former Mexico City Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum, it has mostly been this very shallow, yes, queen, talk about you, the first you know, woman president of Mexico. And yes, that she's the first Jewish president. As you noted, Greg, um, she is not a religious Jewish. Uh, it's part of her heritage, but this is not, uh, she kind of did not emphasize this very much during the campaign. Mexico, obviously a very Catholic country and no indication that she's going to be any particular friend to Israel. So it's kind of a interesting trivia uh, point that the president of Mexico is now named Scheinbaum, but it's not like this is going to see a dramatic change in Mexican foreign policy in a pro-Israel direction or, or anything like that. It's, it's not going to have a, a big influence on the policies. Um, you can really make an argument that AMLO, uh, you know, is, is of the left, is a socialist. I should point out that Scheinbaum is the rare figure that the Associated Press is fine calling a leftist. Now, for perspective, oh <laughs> the Associated Press calls uh, Bernie Sanders a liberal. <laughs> so considerably to the left of Bernie Sanders is a good way of characterizing this. Uh, the socialists over at the Jacobin magazine. By the way, it's not me calling them socialists. They call themselves socialists. They love her. They think this is fantastic. They love her entire program. Now, she says she wants to increase trade with the United States. Uh, so it's, cons and, you know, generally a fan of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal from, from the Trump days. So it's conceivable that we'll see more cross-border trade going on. That might be a little bit of a silver lining. But by and large, this is a leftist who wants to expand the size of government and also really disturbingly consolidate power under the presidency. And this has been a big project under AMLO. AMLO is not pro-democracy. AMLO is not pro-checks and balances and the sorts of things that make for a uh, smooth running government and you know, constitutional government. And of course, you know, AMLO has been very weak on the cartels and there's very little reason to think that Scheinbaum is going to be different on that front. Wait, but I, I, it's, it's conceivable. She, could she go in another direction and surprise us? Yeah, but she ran as a continuation of AMLO's policies. Uh, David Fromm said that in an interview, he was struck by the fact that she did not indicate she wanted to make any changes from what AMLO was doing. So this is the equivalent of another term for AMLO. Mexican policies have not been going well in, a, on, in the right direction on a whole bunch of fronts. This is not good news, I think, for Americans. And I think what's kind of striking is we heard almost nothing about this until the election was done. To the extent we heard anything, it was this very shallow, hey, Mexico has two women candidates and really very little discussion of what they actually wanted to do once in office. Didn't even know there was a, a second woman candidate yeah, in that race. So, so that tells you something. And yes, uh, our international coverage, I think, from our major mainstream sources is not what it used to be. And I think it's less serious. You mentioned that it was like, oh, women, oh, Jewish candidate. And maybe what does this mean for Joe Biden? <laughs> If, yeah. if anything, rather than Remember, Joe like Biden a, is the yeah, Joe Biden is the protagonist of the story, and what happens <laughs> yes. is what happens to our main character, not actually things that affect the country. A little more serious uh, journalism there, also would be very, very good. 
All right. Speaking of Joe Biden, let's move to our crazy martini. And when Biden made his uh, statement about the Trump verdict, on I guess that would have been Friday, that was the opening part of a statement that was meant to highlight the fact that Israel had allegedly authored that Biden approved of a ceasefire got kind of tricky because Biden said it was an Israeli ceasefire and then Obama got on social media and congratulated Biden for coming up with the ceasefire and well now Israel's against what Biden said was Israel's own plan due to uh, confusion within the uh, Israeli war cabinet and so forth but here is what Biden had to say about Hamas uh, late last week and why this really should be ending soon in terms of military activity. At this point, Hamas no longer is capable of carrying out another October 7th, which is one of the Israel's main objectives in this war, and quite frankly, a righteous one. I know there are those in Israel who will not agree with this plan and will call for the war to continue indefinitely. Some, some are even in the government coalition, and they've made it clear they want to occupy Gaza. They want to keep fighting for years. And the hostages are not a priority to them. Not sure about that. I, I see some mission creep there, Jim. Uh, originally, it was Hamas needs to be annihilated. Not Right now, they're not capable of carrying out the same attack they did on uh, October 7th. Uh, Biden also saying in a story reported by Alexander Ward at Politico today that, quote, there's every reason for people in Israel to conclude their Prime Minister Netanyahu is prolonging the war against Hamas to stay in power. And he also said that Israel made the mistake of conducting a Gaza campaign in destructively similar ways to the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I assume he means uh, occupational forces there. And it's just a shame that that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and that he wasn't in a position to influence yeah. policy because uh, he was just in the very, very marginal role of, check notes, Vice President of the United States. You know, there's also been reports right after Raisi died in the helicopter crash. I can't remember if it was the Post or the Times saying that it kind of disrupted efforts that the Biden administration was working on with Iran to to get rid of Netanyahu by either forcing early elections like Chuck Schumer wanted to or undermining him in different ways. So the idea that Biden is somehow a moderate on the issue of Netanyahu and so forth is just ridiculous. But what do you make of him basically suggesting that uh, enough is enough and uh, anything beyond this is Netanyahu just trying to stay in office? We just had an American president say that the Israelis have done something terrible in war as bad as what Americans did. Just just recognize that, that the U.S. You know, uh, actions in Af Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, boy, first of all, we should really go after the people who voted to authorize those missions, shouldn't we? I I'm going to read people the direct comment because Time Magazine asks, some in Israel have suggested that Netanyahu is prolonging the war for his own political self-preservation. Do you believe that? The next two sentences from our president. I'm not going to comment on that. There is every reason for people to draw that conclusion. <laughs> if you're not going to comment, stop. <laughs> don't, don't, don't then give comment. That's, that's, kind of, and then, because you, you, once you've done that, you've already commented on it. You can't say, oh, but it wasn't a, con there's no take backs. You, you, you know, you, you know, you're on the record, Mr. President. Um, two, Netanyahu's got his flaws. And I think he's not necessarily looking forward to, like, like Churchill uh, was was tossed out on his keister after World War II. I think it is very likely that once the operation against Hamas ends, I do not expect Netanyahu to stay in office for very long. But with that said, I have a very hard time believing Netanyahu is going to say, "Oh, let's let's keep Hamas around a little bit longer. Let's let's let them live. Let's let's drag this out as long as possible. Let's increase the risk to IDF forces in the field." And then when Biden says uh, that, well, you know, Hamas couldn't launch the same attack today. OK, so they can only launch half the attack, you know, like, like how how much capacity do we want to leave Hamas? Because I'm really looking for a zero. I'm really looking for no capacity that these guys couldn't organize a two car motorcade or a sack lunch. Never mind another, you know, large scale attack on Israel or a small scale attack on Israel. I'm really looking for zero attacks on Israel. And so uh, how many Hamas guys should be left, uh, you know, Hopefully as little as possible. None, if possible. Is that an option? Can I get none? Because that's that's really what I'm looking for here. And it's just kind of this, you know, ridiculousness from Biden that because he really wants to win the state of Michigan, he's insisting that the war is over. Hamas has suffered it enough. Isn't it time to stop picking on Hamas? And he wants to say that he accomplished something in time for the election, too. In addition to that not being in the headlines every day, 
he's going to claim that he's the one who uh, orchestrated the ceasefire and so forth. It's just like uh, on the border issue, like we talked about a moment ago, his reversal of Trump policies and other uh, policies that have led to 8, 10 million people illegally coming into this country, either processed or, or, or gotaways. And he's going to say, we had a deal before Congress. The Republicans didn't do it. And so I had to take this action. So I'm the only one who really cares about this. Meanwhile, House Republicans had passed their bill a long, long time ago, and the Senate Democrats uh, refused to touch it. He's going to spin all this. But when you've failed for so long and so prominently on these issues, I don't think people are going to buy it. But maybe if they just sense that regardless of his incompetence, things are heading in the right direction, it'll pay off for him. It shouldn't, but it might. I don't know. So um, right before we started taping, I wrapped up the editors, that other podcast that I do. And Rich had asked, would you rather be Trump or Bi- would you rather be Biden with the problem of the border or would you rather be Trump with the problem of the conviction between now and Election Day? And I was like, well, Trump could appeal the conviction, but nothing can, you know, like that's not that decision's not going to come uh, anytime soon. Biden could try to look like a border hawk for the next five months. There's roughly five months between now and Election Day. I don't know if that will persuade people. I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, but at least it's got a shot. And I think that we're now at that stage where we're going to see Joe Biden border hawk. And I suspect you'll be seeing ads with this, you know, that theme going from it. I don't know if it'll, you know, people, oh, wow, B- Biden is tough on the border. Golly, he's, he's much tougher than that guy who wanted to build a wall. You know, I don't think there are that many voters who are, are that persuaded, but it's a very close race. So, you know, if you're Biden, you might as well try it. I don't think uh, there's going to be a lot of minds changed. Uh, there's already a lot of people in the country. And if there's more murders like Lake and Riley that occur because of uh, people that have gotten in due to his existing policies, that could certainly uh, counter what he's doing here. But uh, if it's not on the front page, will people forget about it and focus on other issues come Election Day? I think that's that's what he's hoping for. And Given how few people cared about COVID in November of 2022 compared to some of the other issues that were going on, I think it's fair to wonder whether uh, if the numbers do go down and he actually holds to this 2,500 a week thing, um, whether people will be focused on other stuff. We will see. So, Jim, happy Tuesday, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and join us again on Wednesday for the next 3 Martini Lunch.